So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. James Famiglietti. Sorry if I munched up your name. Uh, Jay is a professor of Earth System uh, Science and Civil Environmental Engineering at UC California Irvine, and he is the 2012 Birdzall Dreis Distinguished Lecturer. Uh, he's also the director of the UC Center for Hydrologic Modeling, and his research group usually um, mostly uses satellite remote sensing to track uh, water availability and groundwater depletion on land. And he's also been working for many years towards improving hydrologic prediction in uh, regional and global weather and climate models. So it's the former topic that he's going to be talking about tonight, and the title of his talk is Water Cycle Change in the Human Fingerprint on the Water Landscape of the 21st Century, Observations from a Decade of Grace. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, everyone, for waiting while we get some of these issues sorted out. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I haven't been uh, to Ames in about uh, 10 years. I was here about 10 years ago for a field experiment in the summer of, of 2002. And uh, it was great to, we were based here in Ames and we're driving around uh, all, around, uh, all around the region um, collecting soil moisture samples from, from farmers' fields uh, while at the same time we're flying uh, our airplanes overhead to test out a new sensor for uh, soil moisture that eventually now will be up on a satellite. So it's great, great to be back. And uh, Christy and I were talking about all I could remember. Uh, well, I remember many things, most of it the work, but I remembered a barbecue place, right? What was it called? Was it Hickory something? Was there a pig in, in that sign? Is there, did I just imagine the pig? No pig. Anyway, I remember the barbecue <laughs> place. And I think I remember that the cobbler was really good, too. So it's funny, the things that, the things that you remember. So I'm doing this lecture tour. Um, it's sponsored by the Geological Society of America. It's a little crazy. Um, I started, and so I'm the lecturer for 2012. The expectation is that um, the lecturer will give about 50 lectures uh, over the course of a year. It's really over the course of about uh, 15 months. So I started in uh, November 2011, and I'll finish up in, in January. So it's a little um, grueling. Uh, and I have, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is lecture number 39, so I'm sort of uh, in the home stretch. I'll be uh, finished up around the time of the AGU meeting, um, and then I've got a little spillover into January when we hope to be going to the Middle East and talk about, I'll show you a little work on some of the, uh, uh, that we've done on the, on the Middle East, but we hope to go to, uh, planning on going to Israel and, and Jordan and Palestine. So um, the title is long, um, uh, and this is work that we started uh, a long time ago before the GRACE satellite, and GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, so it's a satellite mission. I'll be talking about some of the research that we've done uh, using the data from the mission. We started before the satellite was launched, and we started in about 1996 or 1997. So we've been at it for a while. It launched in 2002, and so this decade of GRACE data that I'm talking about is about 2002 to, to 2012. Uh, so uh, I do need to recognize the Geological Society of America for um, honoring me with this um, award. Uh, um, and uh, also the UC Irvine uh, Office of Research and the School of Physical Sciences who have provided uh, additional funding for travel support. And of course, uh, Christy and, and Alice out there somewhere for their help in bringing me in here and taking care of logistics. And uh, Chris, uh, Christy's been driving me around and taking me to dinner. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I, I had uh, ambitious plans when I started this uh, um, lecture tour, and I thought that I was going to be blogging left and right. And so I fired up a blog site, um, and it looks something like this. And um, here's the address. You can go there. You can find the text of some of these talks. You can find some pictures and slides and, and uh, just some other uh, coverage of, of uh, some of the um, lectures that, that I've given. Um, the, the idea was to um, basically write some lecture notes after every, um, every one of these talks and highlight some of the things that are going on in the different water programs. So the audience for the lecturers uh, uh, 
the main audience is, is hydrology programs around in universities around the country. Anyway, I did three, and then I realized I was in way over my head. Uh, okay, so um, this is what I'll be talking about. Um, we'll be talking about a characterization of water cycle change. What do we mean? We hear a lot about water cycle acceleration and water cycle change, water cycle intensification are terms that get thrown around quite a bit. So I'll define what I, what I mean by it, and we'll talk about uh, some of the evidence for that from, from our research. A lot of it comes from our work with the GRACE mission, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Um, so that will be the focus. Um, I'll give three examples of what we might expect to see if the water cycle were intensifying versus what we're actually seeing. Um, and a very uh, heuristic um, explanation, almost a hypothesis of what we might expect uh, in the future, very much hand, hand waving. Um, but I think it's a good idea. Um, and finally, what we should be doing about it, and really that part, if there's, if there's time left, that part is really about communication. And so it's something that I've actually spoken with a lot of people about today. And so there'll be encouragement to the faculty uh, and to students um, to help educate the general public to be better communicators of, of the work that we do. Okay, so uh, water cycle change and the GRACE mission. So when I talk about water cycle change, um, I've, you know, I've been saying this first line is actually one of the first um, uh, sentences that I wrote when I first started my first class in global hydrology at the University of Texas. And I believe that this is true. One of the most palpable impacts of global change may well be changes to the water cycle um, and to freshwater availability. So, uh, for example, in a warming climate, um, we can expect uh, more evaporation, okay? A warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. Uh, so we're expecting more evaporation. What goes up must come down. So more uh, precipitation. And on land, that may well lead to more runoff. So uh, one of the things that we can expect is more cycling of water in the water cycle. More water moving through the water cycle. Um, another thing that we hear a lot about, and I know you folks hear a lot of, uh, about it here um, in Iowa, is an increase in the magnitude and the frequency of the extremes of flooding and drought. Okay? Um, so more extreme extremes. Um, and the third thing uh, that turns out, I think, is one of the things that's probably um, best elucidated by some of the uh, research results that I'll show you um, is the redistribution of precipitation um, from the mid latitudes to the high latitudes and to the low latitudes. So, the, in other words, the wet area is getting wetter and the dry area is getting drier. So, these three things the more uh, cycling, bigger cycling of water through the water cycle, uh, the more extreme extremes, and the wet area is getting wetter, dry area is getting drier. These are the things that I uh, we'll refer to as these are the main components uh, that I'll concern myself with tonight in terms of water cycle change or the strengthening of the water cycle or water cycle acceleration are all terms that are used synonymously. All right, the GRACE mission. Um, again, GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Um, it's a gravity mission. It's a NASA mission. Uh, roughly half sponsored by the German Space Agency, DLR. It was launched in 2002. It's still, still uh, out there today. Uh, the batteries are starting to wither away, and, but we're still getting about 10 months worth of data per year. Um, it could go any time, but there is a, a follow-on plan for 2017. So, so what is it? Um, we see um, the satellites over there on the right side. Um, I think I have a, a picture here for scale, so you can see how big they are relative to uh, a couple of uh, uh, guys doing the work at, over at JPL putting the satellite together. Um, they are up about uh, 450 kilometers. They're separated by about 220 kilometers. These two satellites are used to map the gravity field. They are in a near polar orbit. They follow each other. So they're orbiting around like this. Um, they are, it's not an optical 
satellite. It's not taking pictures of the ground. It's sensing um, gravitational variations. So anything that has mass exerts a gravitational acceleration. The more mass, the stronger the gravitational acceleration. And so what happens with these two satellites is when they encounter a more massive area like the Rocky Mountains, the satellites are pulled down towards the, the mass, towards the mountain, and actually they're accelerated towards the, uh, towards the mountain range. And as they pass that mass anomaly, they, they drift back into, into their original position in the orbit. And so the attraction that the mountains are going to exert is going to be different than, say, the attraction that uh, this region will, will exert. So with it, we're able, with those uh, perturbations of the satellite orbit, um, we're able to map the gravity field. We're basically mapping mass variations and from it inverting those data on the satellite perturbations into a map of the gravity field. And that looks something like this. So as we move from left to right, uh, looking at these different images, we're actually looking at, uh, on the left side, a map of Earth's gravity field um, before GRACE. Okay, so it's a little bit fuzzy, uh, but you can see some of the main topographic and tectonic features of, of the Earth. And then the middle one um, is a bit more sharp, and that's after about 100 days of GRACE data. And then the one on the right is after about... 300 days, or after about a year of, of GRACE data. We've been at it for 10 years, and so we uh, have a pretty refined picture of what the gravity field looks like. Um, so what does this have to do with water? If we make one of these maps every month, what we're really mapping is the change in the gravity field on a monthly basis. So say we're flying over uh, Ames this month, um, we'll get one, you know, there'll be a certain mass that has to do with how much water is in the ground and what the, what the crustal structure looks like. But then suppose it snows and there's a foot of snow on the ground next month. So we come back next month and there's more mass on the ground, so there's a different gravitational acceleration. That difference in gravity is a, a direct measure of the difference in mass, which in this case is a direct measure of the water storage change. So by mapping the gravity field on a monthly basis and looking at the differences, it turns out that those differences on land are mostly due, dominantly, predominantly due to water storage changes. Snow, groundwater, reservoir storage, whatever the changes might, might be. So this sort of summarizes that, that the difference between the two GRACE global gravity fields gives us a time variable component. The main contributors to the gravity field, um, or to the time variations in the gravity field, are these changes in water storage, okay? And we know that the main reason is that water is super heavy. We know that water is really heavy from our uh, personal experiences of whatever, carrying a case of bottled water from Costco, you know, out to the, out to the car, it's super, it's super heavy. Um, so that that gray signal is really dominated by what we see uh, is really dominated by water storage variations. The variations that Grace, so one of the caveats is Grace can't really tell us whether that water storage change is from storage increases in a reservoir or from groundwater depletion or from changes in snow. It just gives us one number. Okay. It's up to us as scientists to pull together other data sets to figure out what's, what's going on. And so we've done, we've done a lot of that. Uh, so GRACE gives us the change in the total water storage, um, and it it's very, works very well, um, but for low spatial and temporal resolution. So we're talking about 150,000 square kilometers or greater, and monthly timescales or longer. So it is not... Um, the kind of satellite that's going to tell you uh, what the wetness is of the, you know, of the soils in the main part of the campus here at Iowa State um, this afternoon, but it will tell you on a statewide level what's happening with total water storage, and we should be able to see things like flooding and drought. Okay, so it's going to be more for regional total integrated water storage. Um, over on the right, so uh, the little picture of the diagram is just meant to, uh, the little picture of the watershed is really just meant to show us um, 
that's what Grace sees. Grace sees actually the change in all of the water in the watershed. So all of the snow, all of the surface water, all of the soil moisture, all of the groundwater. What Grace is telling us is not how much is there, but how much it changes, how much all of that together changes on a monthly basis. And down below are what some of the data look like. These are for Texas. Um, and every dot is a monthly um, storage variation. The units, I can't really see them from here. They could be centimeters per centimeters, not centimeters per centimeter, just centimeters. Um, and so each, each value is an anomaly. Okay? It's an anomaly from a, from a long-term average. And you see in this case, there's a little bit of a downward, uh, a downward trend. So those are what the time series uh, look like. And we'll get back to that particular one uh, a little bit later. So I think a key thing for everyone to remember, if there's one thing you remember about the GRACE mission, it's that it's, it should be this. GRACE is like a giant scale in the sky. It's probably the best way to think about it. And it's not telling you how much you weigh. It's not telling you that you weigh 175 pounds. It's telling you how much weight you've lost, how much weight your region, your watershed, or your aquifer, whatever your region of interest is, has gained or lost on a monthly basis. You've gained a pound. You've gained two pounds. Okay? That's what it's, it's telling you. And here's what some of the data look like. So they're very, you can see the coarse nature of the data. Um, unfortunately, I'll change the color scale around on you one or two times in this talk, and I'll always point it out. Um, so again, these are monthly data. So every time you see a little click here to the next, uh, to the next image, it's another month. So it may be best to just focus on a region like, a, like, I don't know, the Amazon. And so you can see, you know, it's getting more blue, it's drying out. And then the wet season comes in, okay. And so we're just cycling through the months. So you see the annual and interannual variations. Um, so it turns out, and I hope to convince you by the end of the talk, that these data are quite, are quite powerful for, for, many, for many reasons. So here's, here's a couple. Um, on the left, we have a plot of the amplitude of the annual cycle for, and just focus on, I know I have the whole earth shown there, but let's just focus on the, on the continents. Um, so it's a map of the amplitude where the red is a bigger amplitude and the, and the blue is a smaller amplitude. By amplitude, if you look down here at the lower right, I mean the amplitude of, of this curve here, sort of the average amplitude over this time period. And so what that is a measure of, the reason that a storage curve like this would go up, so just basic um, uh, conservation of mass, right? Change in storage is equal to the inflows minus the outflows. So if you have more inflows, the storage is going to go up. And those inflows would be things like precipitation. And if you have more outflows, the storage is going to go down. So if you're thinking about a watershed, those outflows would be evaporation or, or stream flow discharge. Okay. And so the amplitude it becomes a measure of the ups and downs, or how much input, how much precipitation there is, or how much output, how much evaporation, how much runoff there is. So being able to map the amplitude of water storage variations on the continents becomes very important because it's basically a measure of the strength of the water cycle. Now, another, so that's just good to know um, because we need to know how the strength of the water cycle varies from place to place, and in part for water management purposes, but also for prediction. So if we have global or regional models, um, now that we have these data, it would be very good if our models could reproduce um, that type of map here of the amplitude because those ups and downs those inputs and outputs to a system, those are really, that's our rainfall and our evaporation, or when the amplitude gets bigger and the precipitation gets stronger and the evaporation gets stronger, those are your floods and your droughts, okay? So having a measure of the strength of the water cycle or the amplitude of that seasonal signal um, is a nice target for our models and something that I think will help with prediction at seasonal to interannual um, and maybe longer time scales. So a few months to 18 to 24 months or, or longer. On the right is a map of the trends. And um, the reds are places that are gaining water and the blues are places that are losing water. Again, if you just focus on the continents, 
and ignore the oceans because the ocean stuff i'm not an oceanographer and some of the processing i need to get rid of the ocean stuff in my maps so just pretend it's not there um i'll show you a, i think a, a different i'll flip the color scale later and hopefully it'll be a little bit more intuitive when you look at the map but what's that what that is really showing us is the places all over the world that are gaining water and losing water so just a quick look at this map on the right you see the 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 regions that are the most blue are the ice sheets of greenland and antarctica so we know that those those guys are melting away and that's been one of the great success stories of the grace mission has been to be able to to track those to track those uh mass losses uh, following that, um, the Alaskan glaciers and the, and the glaciers down in the southern part of South America, so the Patagonian glaciers. But all the other blue that you see uh, on that map, most of that is related to groundwater depletion. And so, uh, again, I'll show you uh, uh, a figure a little bit later on that has to annotate it a little bit better. But we can see groundwater depletion all over the world, in China and in India and in Australia, in the Middle East, uh, in the United States. So let's, let's move on and I'll show you a better uh, figure for that in, in, in just a little bit. Okay, so uh, just another way to look at some of the data that are coming out of the GRACE mission. So now we're just plotting time series for river basins. Okay, We can do this for aquifers. I'll show you uh, a plot like this for aquifers a little bit later. Being able to have plots to be uh, uh, being able to quantify storage changes so in hydrology we can call this DSDT um, allows us to do many things to track total water availability to close the we call it closing the water balance so maybe we can solve for some unknown like evaporation or discharge um, but just being able to know in an integrated manner what's happening with the water resources uh, in a river basin especially transboundary river basins uh, is a huge contribution of the of the mission. So um, you can see that there's some trends plotted for some of these. Um, some places clearly have downward trends or upward trends. Some are still exhibiting uh, a tremendous amount of interannual variation. The point with this slide is not which basin is gaining water, which basin is losing water. It's more the point is uh, really more that we can do this now. We can track these storage changes. And so it's a, a huge uh, contribution to, to water management. Again, in particular in uh, transboundary basins like, the, uh, like in the Middle East, for example, in the uh, Tigris and Euphrates. Okay, um, so let's go through a few examples of what we might expect to see with an accelerating water cycle and what we're actually seeing. And remember the, the things that I called out were uh, more cycling of water, so bigger, more precipitation, more evaporation, more cycling of water through the water cycle, the more uh, extreme extremes, and this redistribution of water from the mid latitudes to the high and the low latitudes. Again, these are many things that have been predicted by climate models like those used in the IPCC. Uh, so here's a, a figure from a NASA project that I've been involved with for a long time. The project is called NEWS, which stands for NASA Energy and Water Cycle Studies. And so this is a basic diagram of the global water cycle. It looks like something you see in a textbook, except that the numbers are more relevant to the, um, to the satellite, uh, satellite era. So I show this just to let you understand the basic features of the global water cycle. Um, precipitation and evaporation are greater over the ocean than over land. Uh, over the ocean, evaporation exceeds precipitation. We've got this net transport, that 36, which is uh, thousands of the units of thousands of cubic kilometers per year. So the, the net uh, difference of evaporation over precipitation is transported to land as water vapor, where we have where it supports precipitation, and over land, precipitation exceeds evaporation by roughly the same amount, 36,000 uh, cubic kilometers per year. So the question becomes then, in an accelerating water cycle, are these numbers getting bigger? And are we able to see if these numbers are getting bigger? What, uh, what's the evidence? So we used some of the data sets from this NASA news project and focused really on the ocean. Okay? Uh, because those are our best available evaporation, remotely sensed evaporation data sets. That was, main, that was the main reason uh, that we were able to character, uh, characterize the evaporation probably best there. So we looked at the ocean and, uh, 
actually did a mass balance on the ocean. Uh, so we looked at the mass change in the, in the ocean, and that is equal to the inflows minus the outflows, the precipitation, right, minus the evaporation, plus the river discharge into the ocean. And we knew the precipitation and the evaporation and the mass change from a bunch of different satellites, including GRACE, and we solved for the river discharge. So there is a secondary contribution here, which was we were able to estimate global river discharge, which has really never been done before by, by observations. And let me just pull all this stuff up. Um, so there's a lesson here to, to my colleagues, and that is um, when writing a title of a paper, uh, be sure to say what you mean and mean what you say in a very su su succinct um, way. The title of this paper, so I think it's a very important paper, but the title is ridiculously long. Um, and um, it didn't catch on the way that I thought that it, it should. Um, so, and again, I really attribute it mostly to the title. I should have said something like, global river discharge is increasing, and probably would have gotten a lot of, uh, the paper would have gotten a lot more attention. But instead, it was something like, satellite uh, estimation of ocean water balance in solving for global continental discharge or something. Okay, so um, what we were trying to uh, get to here was whether or not we could see these fluxes getting bigger. Are, is there more water cycling in the water cycle? More evaporation, more precipitation? So long story short, the answer is yes. We analyzed the data um, and we found that the oceanic precipitation is increasing by 240 cubic kilometers per year squared. The units are their acceleration units. So it's a, uh, a rate of change of a flux. Um, the evaporation is increasing by a lot more by about 700, almost 770 um, cubic kilometers per year squared. And we're able to solve for river discharge, which is cool in itself, but also uh, uh, shows an increase of about 540 um, uh, cubic kilometers per year squared. So that's actually a significant acceleration. It's actually an acceleration that's 10 times the acceleration of the, ice sh of the rate at which the ice sheets are accelerating. Um, that amount, so here's the time series of discharge just on a monthly basis. So again, that's a very nice technical contribution just, just on its own to be able to do that. There's a slight upward trend there, um, and we have the annual hydrograph shown as an inset up in the upper right. There's a slight increase of about 1.5% per year, and while you may not think that that's very much, if you think about it on decadal scales, it's actually quite significant. So I always say, it's a good thing that it's not bigger, because if it were bigger, we'd probably be in a heap of trouble that we're not prepared for. Um, so what are, what are some of the implications of this first part of what we may already be seeing? Well, if these trends continue, then they'll probably indicate that the water cycle is already accelerating. Um, uh, so it'll be like more or less a smoking, a smoking gun. Um, and there are other uh, implications here, mainly for things like more flooding. Um, and uh, from a water management uh, perspective and a societal perspective, changing flood risk okay? and uh, the need for, say, new uh, inundation maps. So there's a lot of implications for this. More water is not necessarily better. Okay? It just really depends on where you are and the intensity with which it's, it's going to fall. So that's kind of a, a, a nice segue into the second issue that we wanted to explore, which was, uh, are we seeing, what kind of evidence are we seeing for the extremes getting more extreme? Are we seeing more ups and downs, more evaporation, more precipitation? Um, so let's go through a little thought experiment. If we do a mass balance, we just looked at a mass balance on uh, the ocean. Let's look at it again from sort of a box diagram perspective. Um, so you know, I'm going to see if I can move this computer up here. Still good? Okay. Um, so um, let's let's think about a little box diagram, uh, conceptual model of the mass balance on the uh, ocean. So S sub, uh, sub O stands for storage, mass of water in the ocean. 
Okay, here's our inputs and outputs, the river discharge into the oceans, and that includes the ice sheet melt, precipitation, um, and then evaporation is an output. Um, and so if we plot how these things make the storage, the mass of the ocean change over time, it looks like this, and these are actual GRACE data. And so the increasing input increases storage, and so storage goes up, so it's like gaining weight, and then the evaporation or the outputs decrease storage, Okay, so we have this, and I sort of explained this before. Um, uh, we understand why storage goes up and down. Now suppose those fluxes are getting bigger. Suppose those inputs and outputs are getting bigger. Well, then we should expect the storage time series or the amplitude to get bigger. It took us a while. I mean, it seems intuitive now, but um, it took us a while. Um, maybe embarrassed to say, but it took us a while to figure it out. Um, so, you know, we finally recognized, duh, okay, the amplitude is a measure of the water cycle strength, and the change in the amplitude is a measure of the change in the strength of the water cycle. So by measuring the change in the amplitude, we have a metric of water cycle, the change in the strength of the water cycle, or water cycle acceleration, which had been, you know, it's been a pretty difficult thing to quantify. This all comes from this figure. This is a map that shows all of the change in mass of all of the water on the planet. Okay, so the blue line is showing how, this is monthly data, is for almost the whole grace time period, so the blue line is showing how ocean mass goes up and down. We know it goes up and down. Well, like I just showed you, as the inputs and outputs change. And the land, well, look at that. It's completely out of phase, and that's shown in green. Okay? And the other lines are the ice sheets, this Greenland and Antarctica. And so the most striking thing, really, is this out of phase relationship between the land and the ocean. That's just the exchange of water in the water cycle. That, when one goes up, the other goes down. Okay, when that precipitation um, runs off, hello, well, when that precipitation uh, runs off on land, it goes into the ocean. Okay? When that evaporation leaves the ocean, it goes to the land. Okay? So we've got water moving back and forth from the land to the ocean, from the ocean back to the land. So just an interesting aside here. So the thing about the amplitude kind of came to, came to me after you know, watching the data evolve um, each year. And then uh, through about 2007, I thought, oh, man, look at that. The amplitude is increasing every year. My gosh, this is like a science paper waiting to happen. And um, then like 2008 came and 2009 came. I was like, oh, Jesus, you know, amplitude is just decreasing. I lost my big paper. Um, but what I finally decided to do, and we still haven't published this yet, it may never be a big paper, but we'll publish it somewhere at some, some point in time. Just plot the damn amplitude and look at what it does, because it's a measure of the strength of the water cycle. And here's what it looks like. So this is kind of cool, because what it's telling us, if we follow that blue line, or the green line, one is for the ocean, one is for the land, um, it's just showing us how, it's showing us two things how the water cycle is strengthening over time. So it's strengthening through 2007 and decreasing through from 2007 to 2010. Um, but it's also quantifying how much more water is moving back and forth from the land to the ocean and from the ocean to the land. So we can say that much, you know, the 2.8 on the y-axis minus two. So this 0.8 uh, times 10 to the fourth uh, cubic kilometers per year uh, is actually moving more, uh, that much more is moving back and forth uh, between the ocean and the land in 2007 versus 2003. Okay, does that make sense? It's really a direct measure of the strength of the water cycle, and if we put a, a trend through here, either a piecewise trend or trend through the whole thing, that's, a, that's the acceleration. Okay. So we're getting there. If I didn't have to give 50 lectures, I'd probably have the the thing written. Um, so there are, all kidding aside, there are some very important implications of being able to quantify this and what it actually means. And a lot of it has to do with energy. So we're talking about moving more water up and down and back and forth, right? So evaporating more water takes a lot more energy. And that same amount of energy is released when that precipitation condenses out and falls to the ground. So if we're moving more of this water in the water cycle, we have an acceleration in the energy cycle too. 
And that really directly relates to the strength of our storms, the flooding, and the strength of the, of the droughts. Okay? So that's sort of how we get at this. Are the extremes increasing? Uh, are the extremes getting more extreme? Um, this is a way to quantify it. This is one way to quantify it. This is very, uh, albeit very integrated, but it's just another, another piece of the puzzle. Um, it also says a lot of things to me about water management. Um, and it, we have to project into the future and think about if the water cycle is going to become uh, more variable, so I'm looking at this third, third bullet, um, that poses a great challenge to water managers because the primary goal of water management is to damp out that variability. So if you have a more variable signal coming into your black, call it a black box water management system, whether it's a system reservoirs or whatever it is, um, as a water manager, you know, you're supposed to tame that thing. And so the more, the, the more wild it is coming in, the harder your job to, to tame the, the wild uh, water beast. So um, I think there's, there's problems ahead. And then there's the whole socioeconomic side. If these extremes, especially in the developing world, if these extremes are truly becoming more extreme, um, it really um, puts considerable... Um, socioeconomic, uh, political security, and other issues uh, at risk. Since really what society wants, society doesn't deal with these upheavals very well. Um, so if we're having more flooding, more events, more drought, if you're in the developing world, you know, your livelihood system is put at, at risk. Um, if you've been displaced because, displaced because of a flood or a drought, uh, you're more difficult, you know, your country is a, a more difficult place to, to govern. So there's that whole socioeconomic and political side to it. The third, the third issue, are we seeing the redistribution of precipitation from the mid-latitudes to the high latitudes and the low latitudes? Or are the wet areas getting wetter and the dry areas getting drier? This is a famous IPCC figure. IPCC is the big climate assessment report that's done every few years. And it shows patterns of precipitation, uh, changes in the patterns of precipitation at the end of the 21st century. In the winter on the left, in the summer on the right, the red areas are getting drier, the blue areas are getting wetter. So this is what models predict. Okay. So what are we seeing from grace? So I've changed the color scale now. And um, so this is the trend map. And it's for this particular map is for 2002 through 2010, but the the 10 year map looks almost exactly the same. Um, so now the red areas are getting are losing water, and the blue areas are gaining water. And I'll go through some of these signals in just a minute. But uh, so I asked the question here. You know, I I've been wearing my grace goggles for so many years that I I I can't tell blue from from red anymore. But I. I, I think I see a lot of red in the in the mid latitudes here, and I think I see a lot of blue uh, in the high latitudes and the low latitudes. And so I asked this question: Hey, you know, are we seeing some of this redistribution already? Yeah, it's only been 10 years, um, but again, is this a nice? You know, we have we have uh, an uh, an observing system here with which we can uh, keep an eye on this. So, are we already seeing this redistribution? Maybe more. You know, time will tell. Um, but maybe more compelling is uh, what those blobs and colors and everything actually mean. And I started to point out some of this before. Let me go through it in a little bit more detail now. So again, the red areas are the places that are losing water. And so the biggest loss signals are the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. There have been some great papers written on those. Um, and then after that, uh, the glaciers in Alaska and in Patagonia are probably the next biggest signals. Just about all those other red spots, almost all of them on this map, the red and the yellow, are tied to groundwater depletion or drought or both. Because when you have a drought, um, by definition, there's no surface water, so you're going to use groundwater. So just look around the world. That's where this title of the, the human fingerprint on the water landscape comes from. Because all those red blobs, I mean, look around, look at China. Okay, look at the North China Plain. Look all around the Tibetan Plateau. India, we have a paper uh, on groundwater depletion in India, but you can see those blobs all around the Tibetan Plateau. Look at the Middle East. 
Okay, there are major aquifers there. Look at the southeastern United States, the High Plains Aquifer, California, okay, down the, uh, the Guarani Aquifer down in Argentina. Um, so uh, just about every um, uh, mid-latitude uh, aquifer is, is being depleted of its, of its groundwater. Um, and I've got some more details to show you on, uh, on how, we, how, we figure that, how we figure that out. How do we know that it's groundwater? Uh, let me just go through this kind of quickly. Um, what Grace tells us is the top line. The change in storage is e uh, on land is equal to the change in the snow and the surface water and the groundwater um, and the soil moisture. So if we want to figure out in one of those red blobs that I just showed you how much of that signal is groundwater, we have to solve the second equation. And so that means we get the delta S land from grace and we have to get other data sets on the snow and the surface water and the soil moisture and pull those out of the signal. In other words, if you look at the watershed figure here on the, at the lower left, if you want to isolate the groundwater that's on the bottom, we have to remove the mass signal of everything that's above it, the soil moisture, the surface water, the snow. Okay, and we get those other data sets from in situ observations from other remote sensing. And when we don't have any other data, we have to rely on models. And in the developing world, uh, or in conflict-prone regions, or in regions where we don't have any friends, uh, we have to rely on models. Um, so here's an example from California. It's an, like very much like this one, agricultural region, except we really focus on produce uh, over there. What you may not realize is that it's the second most pumped aquifer in the United States after the High Plains Aquifer. Subsidence has been going on there for a long time. This is a famous figure of a USGS scientist standing next to a well casing. So this is the inside of a well. And so the surface in 1925 was way up at the top. And so there's been you know, meters and meters of, of subsidence. Um, so if you look on the right side, we've basically gone through this exercise of taking the grace signal, which is the upper left chart, um, and subtracted from it the snow water equivalent which is in the upper right, the surface water storage, and the soil moisture, okay? So we take A and we subtract from it B, C, and D, and we're left with the groundwater. And this is what it, this is what it looks like. So this shows us very clearly uh, how the groundwater signal, the groundwater storage in all of the Central Valley in California uh, from 2002 through 2006, more or less, was just had a sort of a normal seasonal cycle. But then the drought kicked in. And what happened in California was that the farmers did not get their surface water allocation from snowmelt from the Sierras. And so they had to hit the groundwater, and they hit it pretty hard. And so we get this big decrease that shows up very, very clearly. It's about 20 cubic kilometers of groundwater, um, which is about two-thirds the volume of Lake Mead. So it's a lot. It's a lot of water. I'm not trying to say that the farmers shouldn't have done that. Uh, I'm just trying to say that we can see this with satellites, and perhaps this would be a nice... Uh, tool that we can throw into our water management um, arsenal. So similar results for, uh, for India, probably the region on the planet that has the greatest uh, amount of groundwater depletion. The blue line, the solid blue line shows the time series of the groundwater and the dashed blue line shows the, um, shows the trend. And that, uh, in that time period from August 2002 through October 2008, there was about well, almost 110 cubic kilometers of groundwater depleted. So three times the volume of, of Lake Mead. Here's the Middle East. This paper is uh, still in review in water resources research. Same exercise. Take the gray signal of total water storage, shown in the upper right, subtract from it the snow, the surface water, the soil moisture. Uh, some of it came from remote sensing. Some of it comes from data on the ground. Some of it comes from uh, computer models. The soil moisture comes from models. And so you're left with this groundwater time series in the lower right. And it's a similar decrease. Our most recent number has it at about 80 cubic kilometers of... Uh, so the total, uh, the, the region lost about 150 cubic kilometers of water and that big red signal there is pulled out of that global map. So that's sitting on top of Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Okay. So huge depletion signal. Uh, five times the volume of Lake Mead over this grace time period. And a little bit over half of it is groundwater. 
or that's about the best that's about our best estimate it's sort of an example of a place where you were trying to show I think the best that we can do without having access and collaborators and so on in the in the region so when you can't get data this is a nice example of what you can, what can be done by satellite and using computer models um, it's not just those aquifers happening all over the world. So these are just some of the time series that show the storage changes from uh, other of the aquifers, uh, the North China Plain, Australia, we think that one's related to uh, mining, uh, the water use for mining activities there. Uh, South America, uh, I showed you California. I have another chart of California and the US, which I'll show you in a little bit. So to me, this is a problem. Okay, and this is a problem because we have climate change and the dry area is getting drier. Well, by definition in the dry areas, we use groundwater because it's dry. So we're accelerating the drying. Okay. They're great places to live. I live in California. It's wonderful. Okay. I don't belong there. None of us belong there. Uh, population is growing in those, in those regions. So we've got climate change, we've got population growth, and some very rapid and most likely unsustainable uh, rates of groundwater uh, depletion. So I, I'm very concerned about that. Little arm waving about how are we doing on time? I'm probably going way over. Um, no, we're, we're going to blame it on the microphone, right? I've got 10 extra, 15 extra minutes because of the microphone. Okay, complete arm waving here. So feel free to call me on it. But don't be like Mitt Romney and walk right up to the, to the edge of the boat because that, that'll just freak me out if you do that. Uh, so if you think about um, temperature on glacial and interglacial time, uh, time scales, it might look like this. So, you know, it's cold. So I'm trying to link these storage variations and the strength of the water cycle to temperature variations making the case that we have a stronger water cycle when temperature increases. Um, so if we look at glacial, interglacial time periods, it looks roughly like this. And I drew this by hand with one finger on my, on my mouse pad, so it's, it's totally hokey. Um, uh, but if we think about some of these grace, so I'm trying to put this in the context of what we see from grace. If you think about what we see from grace, this is supposed to be a very low amplitude storage curve because all the water's frozen. So and we actually saw this, I didn't really point it out, but when I showed you the Greenland and, and Antarctica ice sheet time series, they had like no amplitude. Okay? The water's frozen, so there's no input and output. There's no very little evaporation precipitation. It's a frozen water cycle, right? The water is sort of in the freezer and it's not moving around. Does that, does that make sense? Nothing's happening. Um, but as we go from a, a glacial into an interglacial time period, well, you know, the temperature increases and water starts to melt and water starts to cycle around and so it starts to move around whether it's in a region or whether we're talking back and forth between the land and the ocean so we're getting more more ups and downs more precipitation more evaporation so we've actually always been seeing this increasingly energetic water cycle we just really weren't paying much attention to it we kind of tend to think that water cycle acceleration is something that's only happening right now i would argue it's been going on for and i'm waving my answer so I argue that's been going on for a long time okay so why do we care if we're just going to go into another glacial period and things are going to get cold and all the water is going to freeze and we're not going to have any more floods or any more droughts because all the water will be frozen and the water cycle will slow down why should why should we care well, I think the reason is that we now expect that that's not going to happen, okay? That we're not going to go into another glacial period because the greenhouse forcing is greater than the orbital forcing. So the addition of CO2 to the atmosphere is causing where it's too warm, right? It's uh, sort of negating the cooling that we would get from, from the orbital variations, okay? So by extension, What's going to happen with the water cycle? We're going to get really crazy. Is we're going to, get to see this higher amplitude that I've been talking about? The more ups, the more downs, the more precipitation, evaporation, storm, drought. Okay, so we can go back to this figure, this sort of chart of the amplitude. So this is sort of a representation of where we are right now in time. This is what the the strength of the water cycle looks like, 
And so just to put this in the context of that last figure, in a glacial period, maybe that number would be, you know, way down here, zero, and in the future, it, you know, maybe we can track this thing and see where it goes, and maybe it's going to be way up there. Okay. So I'm a little frightened by that. Uh, you know, just a plug, so this is now sort of a blow up, a slightly different time period. So we now have a new release of the GRACE data. This one is release of five. And this time period that I'm showing is 2004 through 2012. And I just wanted to show you um, a few things. Um, so plots for California, in the lower left, and for Texas um, in the middle, and, and for you know, pretty close to here uh, on the right. And so there's a few things that I think pop out pretty clearly. And I'm trying to make the case that we have a lot of information contained in the GRACE data, but we're not using it. Okay? It's not, it has not made its way into operations. And, and I guess the, the backdrop for that is there's really a lack of resources that are being pumped into hydrologic prediction. I think that we have a lot of things that we could do with our models and with ingesting and integrating in remotely sensed data. And so here's an example. Um, uh, so take the Texas time series. So it's just the time series that shows what's happening there in East Texas. Well, I was over there giving a lecture uh, in November, and everybody said, uh, so it was right there at the end of 2012. And you see that big dip, right? So that's when I was there, and everyone said, oh, this drought has been going on for the last 11 months. And so I pulled out these data, and I looked at it, and I said, wow, I don't know, you know. Maybe this drought's been going on for two years because... You know, you can see the sort of decrease through 2010, and a little bit more broadly, maybe it's been going on since about 2007, because, you know, you could stick a line through there. Or maybe it's just been decreasing the whole damn time frame that we've had grace data, and you can make that argument as well. So there's information there. And likewise, I mean, look at this plot for the Missouri River, right? This is just for this region, right? You know, very close to here. And... I think that there's a lot of information on flooding here, okay? So if you're a water manager and you're looking at those peaks going up every year, you know, you'd probably start to think, geez, we might be having a flood here sometime soon. So my point is, see, there's information there. And then, you know, maybe you can even start to see the drought kicking in. It doesn't go far enough forward in time. But maybe we're seeing a little bit of this recent drought kicking in. But there's definitely information there. And so I think we need to think a little bit more carefully. I think we can be doing a better job predicting flood and drought, bottom line. And so these are new data. They haven't quite made it that transition to operations, but it's hard in a resource-limited uh, environment. But I do think there's a lot of information there. Oh, this is my doom and gloom slide, uh, which I've taken now to, I should, just, I should just cut it out, because this is the slide that will make everybody cry just basically say, you know, we're going to hell in a handbasket, it's going to be hotter, it's going to be wetter, it's going to be crowded, and there's, you know, the grim reaper is going to come, he's going to say floods and droughts and sea level rise, and I'll skip that one. Uh, uh, just a little bit on communication. What should we be doing about it? Well, I mean, we're the guys that are doing the research. Right, so let's keep doing all the great work that we do. And, and for you students who are here, you're already taking a huge step forward by devoting yourselves to uh, environmental careers. Or if you're just here to get the extra credit, that's cool too. <laughs> um, but you know, we have to be doing the best available research. I believe that we have a need to educate the general public. So I think that's a responsibility we need to take a little bit more seriously. So to faculty and to research scientists, I say this quite a bit. You know, I don't think, sometimes I don't think, I think we sell ourselves short. I don't think that we recognize the importance of the work that we do. And you know, you and I just had this conversation and you said something like, yeah, what I'm doing is not really that important. And you know. <laughs> And, and so sorry to call you out on that. And I agreed. It's like, yeah, we suck. Yeah. But, uh, but really, that's not true. Because think about the things that you work on and that your students work on and that I work on. And we're talking about better prediction of flooding and drought and sustainable water management and, and all the stuff that I just showed you. So I think it's very important. I think as a community, we need to do a better job publishing in higher profile journals because those are the, like science and nature and the letters journals, GRL. I was a GRL editor for a long time. 
and the number of pure hydrology papers that I got to review was extremely small. And to me that says we don't think our work is that important because we're not trying to publish it in, in letters journals. So I disagree. I think we're all working on sustainable water management and I think it's very important. Like I said, students, thank you so much for devoting yourselves to the environment. I talk to so many students now, and I always I say a couple of things. One is that I'm going to forget you the minute I walk out of this room. So I apologize for that in advance, because I've just seen so many students. Um, that was a joke. You can, you can laugh. Um, uh, but the other thing that I, I get a lot from students is that they're very interested now in policy, in affecting policy. And so if you really want to affect policy, you have to kind of get into the, the mind, you have to get into the policy world. So consider taking courses in policy or, or in law, environmental law. I'm starting to think that the water lawyers rule the world from a couple of uh, meetings that I've gone to recently. Push your supervisors, they're going to thank me for this, to consider the societal implications of how your work can impact decision making. Maybe I was drunk when I wrote that. Uh, <laughs> This one is very important. Hone your oral and written communication skills. In my group, we actually practice, we call it our sound bites. We practice them every, you know, maybe once a year. So really think carefully, you know, good, uh, uh, some good guinea pigs are your roommates, your parents, your siblings. You have to be able to, these are great people to test all this stuff out on. Try to say in very simple terms what you're working on. Okay, I worked on mine. I say something like, "Yeah, I use what well, was in my in my bio. Uh, I use uh, remote sensing and develop computer models to track water how water availability is changing around the world." I think people can understand that. I mean, we don't have to get into like you know the real details that make us sound super smart. We're trying to really convey this information uh, to the general public. So practice on your, on your family. And I do think that we have a, uh, an obligation to uh, educate the general public because they don't really understand unless we tell them, right? Uh, no, I think your community may be a little bit more savvy, right? Because you, in this region, because you're having the floods and you're, you know, you're having the drought and there's, it's a big farming community. But like in Southern California, they're literally in la-la land. I mean, they just think that water just flows through a big pipe to their, to their home. Uh, so, you know, we need to help people understand where water comes from. In California, it comes from the Sierras. Well, it's the, the snow is melting. I mean, the snowpack is decreasing every year. It comes from the Colorado River Basin, same deal, right? The snow is disappearing. And it comes from groundwater, a lot of which we recycle. And if we didn't recycle it, we'd be running out. Uh, so we need to help educate the, the public. As a community, I think that we need to elevate our issues to the level of everyday understanding. Other communities are doing it and have really benefited from it. And we need to do the same. Our issues are super important. Uh, here's a picture of my group. We're actually at the recycling facility uh, in, in Fountain Valley. And so, uh, uh, Christy, next time you come to Ir Irvine, we'll take you here because it is super cool. I think they should film James Bond movies there. We're actually drinking the recycled water right there. So the sewage facility, the sewage treatment plant is right there. It's co-located. The water goes from the sewage treatment facility to the recycling facility. It's tertiary treated, uh, so microfiltration and reverse osmosis and UV radiation with hydrogen peroxide, and we're drinking it, and we're surviving. And we've been drinking it for a long time. It gets injected right back into the aquifer. Some of it is used to, as a barrier against saltwater intrusion, about half of it, but the other half just mixes with the drinking water supply. That is all I do now. I'm required, I'm obligated to say, please go to our website and like us on Facebook. And so that's uccham.org, University of California Center for Hydrologic Monarch. Thank you so much. All right, so I think you probably have enough energy to take a few questions. Thousands. Test, test. Sure.
Sure. I have just a technical question. So on the last grace data that you had, yeah. can you go back to that slide, please? It's possible. So I, I don't understand the scale here in the bottom. So it says mass loss. So positive numbers means losing mass, and negative numbers would be gaining mass? No, it should, no. Positive numbers are gaining mass, right? So positive is an increase in storage. It's just like all the other ones. Okay, so if it's so going up, right, okay. it's right. Missouri then is increasing then. Yeah, okay. right. So that was my point about the flooding, right? right? Just want to make sure it just looked yeah. different from right. it. And there are always anomalies. There are anomalies with respect to long-term average, which is really like the static gravity field that's not the average amount of water. I know people want to go home. Uh, you showed the, um, the figures for groundwater depletion in the Central Valley and uh, the, the High Plains. Uh, have, you, have you done any work trying to correlate what you extracted from the GRACE data with what you actually see on the ground? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so most of the first five or six years, uh, thank you. I, I, I need to reinsert that slide back in there that shows all of the validation work that we've done for years and years and years. So the first uh, several years of work that we did was not particularly glamorous and really nobody cared. Um, we just get all, get all the data sets we could around the United States. It's very difficult actually to put together data sets that are at that grace scale because we don't really have that many observations. So in the United States, um, we've got good data in Oklahoma, we've got the Illinois data set. We do what we call coupled land atmosphere water balances, which we can do for, for large regions, and we compare to global scale computer models. And we also um, have done some work where we try to estimate unknowns like river discharge, which I showed you, or evaporation, so, so it just depends on the region, and we compare those to observations as well. So we have always done and will continue to do anytime we start up a new project the best sort of validation that we can do for the region and make sure that uh, we're on track. And it's because of that that I can go and present this sort of stuff that, and have confidence in the stuff that I've presented today. So excellent question. You mind if I ask one? Go right ahead. So the, the amount of water lost or, or gained is, it's, it doesn't in aquifers. It doesn't really discriminate which aquifer that's occurring in, right? So you right. could, so you could have an aquifer near the surface and one down deep. But if you if you assume that most of the water was coming from the the one nearest the surface, and you had head information from that, yes. could you make huge maps of storativity values all across these major yeah. aquifers? We're at, so we should talk about that a little more. We're, we're doing something very similar to that. I think that there are ways to get at, you know, there's information here, like the active range of storage and that sort of stuff, which I think if you combine it with some other data sets, we can get at some of these um, effective porosity or effective oh, yeah. storage capacity. So yes, I think that that can be done. But we should talk a little bit more cool. because I come at it from really not from the groundwater side, but some more sort of holistic pseudo groundwater. That's why you come to Iowa to find exactly this, huh? yeah. right, right. To answer some of the questions that Bill raises, what? Can you give me an idea of what kind of resolution in both space and time these data and yeah. are those getting better as you acquire I wish they more were. years? No, I, w I wish they were. So uh, the resolution is fairly coarse. So it's not a you know it's not a panacea. It's uh, two uh, one hundred fifty thousand square kilometers or greater. Um, how big is Iowa? Is that about one hundred fifty thousand? I don't know. Sorry, should have done my. My Iowa homework, uh, and monthly and longer. Okay, and at at that at those uh, space time resolutions, the error is about one and a half centimeters. Okay, so in other words, the signal has to be bigger than that to be detectable. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that as you go to longer space time scales, so seasonal or annual which, you know, maybe after we have 20 years of grace data, we can start doing that. Then the error actually decreases. So uh, 
Now, the next part of the question was, are we going to have any increases in resolution? Not really. Uh, the follow-on, the 2017 follow-on mission, the reason it was approved was because it's almost exactly the same mission, and that's a political thing. So that you don't get upset that your mission didn't get, so it actually got shoved forward. It was the, the follow-on mission, an improved follow-on mission, was slated for about 2030. And because of some of this work with groundwater and because of the ice sheet work, there was a push to just keep it going, to not lose the, the data set. So in order to not offend uh, other scientists who had other missions that were originally ahead of the GRACE follow in the queue, we decided, not we, but the NASA higher-ups decided, okay, let's just do the same thing, and then no one will be upset. And we'll just call it a climate continuation mission. So it's the same thing. In 2030, however, there will be <laughs> higher space-time resolution. I assume that I'll be retired uh, at that point in time. But so the improvements will come in probably, you know, we'll probably start, well, we're working on them now. And there's a lot of ideas for four satellites and, you know, different configurations. Um, but those will be in the next, you know, probably the late 2020s. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. That's, so, that's, so the question was, um, what sort of rates on, say, water cycle change uh, are available uh, before the GRACE data? And maybe even using paleoclimate data or something. And I, I really have, I have no idea. I think it's an excellent question. Um, remember, this stuff is, this is new. I mean, I just sort of figured this stuff out just for the GRACE data, just for this time period. But I think it's an excellent question. Um, and maybe we could, you know, maybe if we have data on precipitation or other proxies for precipitation and, I don't know, river discharge or something like that, maybe we could sort of try to reconstruct the amplitude. I don't, I don't know, but an excellent question. Any other questions? Okay. Christy really wants to go I, home. I actually have yeah. a final question, but I'll let yeah. her right. <laughs> Can you go back to the global river discharge graph? Yeah, sure. No one ever asked about that, so... I'm happy to go back. I'm just curious because I thought it said 1994 to 2006. It did, yeah, yeah. So what was the data you were using to graph that? So this, well, you're quite sharp. Uh, so uh, we didn't use very much GRACE data in this. So this, uh, so there's a, a paper that I can send you the, the citation on because I, I think it was quite clever. So what we actually used was sea level rise data, okay? And so, you know, if you know anything about sea level rise, that's not just the mass, it's the thermal expansion part and the mass part. So you have to strip out the thermal expansion part. And we used a couple of, the reason that we used this 2004 to, uh, uh, sorry, 94 to 2006 um, uh, time period is because those were the, the time spans of the temperature data sets. So we had sea level rise data from altimetry, these altimetry satellites. We subtracted the thermal expansion part um, to get the mass change. Okay, so now we have our, our DSDT for the ocean. Um, and the only way GRACE comes into this is in the overlap period from about 2002 to 2006. We compared that mass change to the GRACE mass change. So that's how GRACE comes in. And then the, the, the precipitation, the evaporation were these NASA, it's actually multiple data sets. So we had a whole bunch of data sets and we did a whole bunch of mass balances and what you're seeing here is sort of the ensemble mean. But a good question and very, very sharp. Someone was paying attention. Uh, Christy's ready I'll, with I'll that answer. last question. I'll By the way, uh, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, my last name is, uh, we pronounce it Family Eddie. Family okay, Eddie. Like, fa well, like Family Eddie. That would have been easier. Yep. Well, now you know. <laughs> Next time. I know. I've known you for about 10 years, and I still don't know how no, to No, that's all right. I, 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 <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Uh, so mine gets uh, back a couple questions earlier, and I think you've kind of answered it. Um, it relates to any gaps that we might have between the end of this GRACE mission and the beginning of the next one. 
and how that might impact our ability to understand variability during that time period where we may or may not have data. Yeah. And But maybe more a more relevant question would be, uh, does that pose any uh, issues with respect to trying to get water managers to use this data, just based yeah, on the uncertainty probably. of... Yep. Is it going to be available when they need it? Yeah, good. Uh, so good question. And so the other the other part of that is also the latency. So how long before you can actually get your hands on the data? So, you know, I'm trying to make the case. There's no reason why it can't happen. It's really just trying to get a program manager in the Grace Science Team program manager and shake them around and have enough water management people say, wow, this would be really cool. We really need to have it. And it's you know it's not that big a deal, um, so the latency part is not a not a huge deal. I think that's just a more of an awareness thing on the at the head, at, at headquarters. The bigger deal is the uncertainty over the the gap. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, it still will take people time. It'll take agencies, operational entities, time to figure out how to use the data. So they can be working with the the data sets we have now to get ready for. 2017 and hopefully you know another 10 years of of data but a, a very good question there is a there's another question christy's question was supposed to be the last question <laughs> two hundred thousand square kilometers That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So um, there's a couple of answers to that. One is that Central Valley study that I showed you. Okay. And so actually by combining these various data sets, the Central Valley part of that region is only 50,000 square kilometers. So you know, by constraining uh, all the different fluxes, we're able to isolate the, by having a bunch of auxiliary data sets, we're able to say, this is what's happening in the Central Valley. So that's one way. The other way, which I think is probably the best approach, is to ingest these data into our regional models and use the models to do the, the downscaling, the physically based interpolation or downscaling or whatever you want to call it. And there's been some examples of that that have been published. Say, you know, uh, my former student, Matt, Matt Rodell, you know, we continue to collaborate, um, has looked at the Mississippi River Basin and the sub-basins of the Mississippi and constrained uh, those with GRACE data, but then used the model to, to basically uh, uh, insert, add resolution. So it's model, sort of a model data product. That could be our best that could be our best bet right now.